Okay, welcome everyone to this um, panel. Um, I apologize for the uh, short delay in the start. This panel is um, entitled International Finance and Global Justice, a brief look at finance, colonial continuities and the climate crisis. My name is Matthias Schmelzer. Um, I'm part of Konzeptwerk Neue Ökonomie, um, the NGO which hosts this conference. Um, and I also worked on the book that uh, laid the basis for this conference. Um, I'm an economic historian and also worked on international and global finance. That's why I'm really happy and honored to facilitate this panel with three amazing speakers, which I will introduce shortly. The panel is translated into German and the link should be posted in the chat. Nochmal auf Deutsch, das Panel wird auch auf Deutsch übersetzt. Der Link müsste im Chat auftauchen. So, what's this panel about? When most people think about a utopian future in the year 2048, so in the long-term future, a world beyond inequality, hierarchies and domination, we normally don't think about finance. We think about health, safety, housing, food and other very concrete needs. Most people would not, at least not at the beginning, think about banks, money, debt, currencies, inflation, central banks or other such opaque issues. However, the question of how to achieve climate justice, to, um, to end persistent neo-colonial relations and inequality cannot be answered without looking into the realm of international finance. Which role will finance play in the future for all? And maybe most importantly, which role does finance, so banks, money, debt, currencies, etc., play in the transition to such a future for all? These are the questions we will discuss in this panel. And we have three amazing speakers um, that will help us go through these complicated topics. So Daniela Gabor um, is a ferocious feminist, professor for macroeconomics at Bristol University in the UK. Her numerous research interests on which she has published widely are, among others, shadow banking, central banks and development finance, also green finance. Daniela will provide some insights into the seemingly opaque realm of current international financial practices. Ndongo Silla is world champion in Francophone Scrabble, as he wrote in the biography um, put on the website. He's also an economist um, at the Rosa Luxemburg office in Dhaka, Senegal. He has done research and also published on fair trade, global inequalities, and is a specialist on the CFR front zone. Ndongo speaks on a progressive pan-Africanist alternative to the French-dominated neo-colonial monetary imperialism. Finally, Anne Löscher is a Mercedes chess adversary and pursues a PhD project on the macroeconomic implications of the climate crisis and international finance at the University of Sieg in Germany. She's also a member of the Network for Plural Pluralist Economics and coordinates the Wissenschaftliche Arbeitsgruppe, so scientific working group on sustainable money. And she will shed light on the interactions between finance and the climate crisis at the periphery. So we will begin with um, a longer input by these three experts, but don't worry, they promise to speak with easy words, slowly and without using acronyms. Um, and you can already start to put questions in the, into the chat. We will collect them and discuss them with the panelists in the last 30 minutes after the input. And with this, I hand over to you and look forward to the discussion. Yes, we changed our title a little bit. Don't get confused. And it's less of a uh, panel discussion, but more of a conversation among the three of us. So our current title is Utopias After Global Finance. Very ambitious. And yes, we start off with a problem diagnosis of uh, multiple crises and then move on to a more visionary version of how we think things might improve. Daniela. Ah, yes, that's me. Okay, I'm I'm taking over. Um, uh, what we 
I'm hoping that we'll manage to do today, uh, besides making life easy for the translators and not using acronyms, is to convince you that in order to think about utopias, we have to think of where we are now and why, in order to get to any utopia that is progressive, we need to think very carefully about the importance of global finance and we have to go through global finance and in a sense to defeat global finance as a political force that is shaping the way in which current narratives about crises uh, are being sh uh, are being uh, developed uh, and what and alternatives to this uh, um, sort of current narratives um, can emerge. So uh, just to remind ourselves uh, where we are now, we are in a global pandemic. This global pandemic has uh, already affected countries in the global north and global south uh, quite dramatically. Uh, if Anne goes to the next slide, you will see that uh, even, even for advocates of degrowth, this slide, uh, this uh, graph looks quite terrible. It shows us that most countries will face very severe recessions in, in this year, in 2020. Almost uh, every country in the world will go through a, a recession. And that's very important because it means uh, a significant collapse in employment, a significant collapse in aggregate demand, that is in um, uh, what we consume and what we produce. Uh, and that's a, a crisis with very uh, serious social consequences. So employment, unemployment is uh, knocking on the door everywhere. Uh, next slide, please. And it's for the countries in the global south, this is going to look even worse, not only unemployment, but there is a, a very significant external debt crisis that is coming because most countries in the global south have to um, uh, issue uh, debt denominated in dollars or in foreign currencies in order, for example, to pay for imports. Uh, most countries are uh, issuing debt to uh, global investors. And when the pandemic hit, we saw why this reliance on external debt is very significant because investors, and these are portfolio investors, it's a particular type of uh, financial asset, but these portfolio investors ran out of most countries in the global south. And that's a problem for a variety of reasons, most importantly, because currencies tend to depreciate very quickly. Governments get very concerned. When governments get very concerned, the, the standard responses that you, you will see are either to increase interest rates and that, that uh, can have uh, severe consequences for growth or to shrink uh, 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 fiscal balances or spending, again, with severe uh, social consequences. However, not everybody has had a bad crisis and, and that brings us back to the question of global finance. If there was a, a social group, let's call it the 0.1% or the 0.01%, if there is a social group that has been done very well in this uh, crisis, it's uh, global finance. Here uh, we are showing you a, a graph of the performance of one of the most important global investors called BlackRock. Uh, BlackRock is an asset manager. It manages a, uh, assets for uh, institutional investors like pension funds, like my pension fund probably has some money with BlackRock. It manages uh, uh, the money of uh, insurance companies that bring us back to ideas about uh, how we organize our health system through private insurances. And BlackRock is, is important as a, as a global actor in global finance because it, it has uh, incredible political power. It's uh, been the financial institution that implemented some of the uh, uh, crisis measures of the United States Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, and it's it's been doing very well. So this is something that we need to bear in mind that while regular citizens all over the world are, are being hit very severely by the global financial crisis, uh, the global finance has had a very good uh, crisis with uh, profits returning to uh, quite uh, si significant levels after uh, the initial hit uh, provided by COVID. I'll let Ndongo continue. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Daniela. Um, what what Daniela j just said about uh, global finance, I think we could uh, find uh, the same logic during, during the colonial era. Because during the colonial era, global, I would not say global finance, but international finance, metropolitan finance, had the same types of relationships uh, to, the, to the global south. 
uh, most people imagine that uh, uh, with uh, what is called uh, decolonization uh, implied, let's say, access of the um, countries of the global south to full sovereignty. In fact, they uh, what happened mostly in, in Africa is that uh, colonial administrations have been replaced by African administrations. But the economic and financial structures are uh, in place. That means uh, decolonization haven't changed, hasn't changed uh, the economic and um, financial structures. And uh, you see that uh, often uh, it is said that African countries have to have to open to trade, have to open to 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 finance. But you will see that countries like Senegal or um, Cote d'Ivoire, here you see in the map. Are generally much more open to global finance than even Germany or the UK. Why? Because you see that their banking structures are highly dominated by foreign foreign banks. Uh, you take, for example, the case of uh, of, of Ghana. The share of uh, uh, foreign assets in total banking assets is higher than in Germany. Uh, same thing for Senegal. If you take the case of also of a foreign direct investment, you will see that a country like Japan the stock of foreign debt investment that means the cumulated net flows of foreign investment in japan is less than five percent of the gdp of japan you go to ghana it's more or less uh, six sixty percent so every time they say you are not open you have to open but you see that those kind of countries uh, even if they have formal political sovereignty but they are still shaped by global finance. And when we talk about global finance, there's a qualitative difference between what happened uh, uh, during colonial time. During colonial times, uh, the capital from France dominated French colonies. The capital from Britain dominated Br uh, British colonies. But now there is a, somehow a, a blend of all kinds of capital, capital from China, from, uh, I don't know, Mexico, from the UK, from Germany, and they are dominating, let's say, um, financial uh, structures in the in the global south so many countries of the global south are shaped by by global finance to say that they are controlled through their banking and financial structures they are working along let's say the more or less along the dictates of global finance and they are also very dependent on external finance as daniela said especially in times of crisis so and maybe going so additionally to uh, the COVID crisis and colonial continuities, we've got a third crisis which is uh, hitting the global south in particular, which is uh, the climate crisis. So I'm not telling you anything new, but um, this graph is quite telling when it comes down to the severity of the crisis. So here, this yellow strip um, indicates the time in which Homo sapiens managed to settle and build um, human complex societies. And this is about when I was born. And you see by the end of uh, this century, um, we we'll hit a point when uh, we are like already experiencing a, a four degree um, global warning, a warming as compared to pre-industrial levels. And by 200 and uh, at 2200, we'll probably have experienced uh, a climate uh, catastrophe which is making uh, human society uh, or complex human societies impossible. Uh, those effects of global warming are, are unevenly distributed. Here you can see that extreme weather events and extreme hot extremely hot days are currently concentrated around the equator so it is once again the global south severely affected by the climate crisis and much more so than the global north but this is only for the moment because obviously in the global north countries will experience much more extreme weather events 
And this, because we're talking about global justice, it's just a graph showing you who is actually responsible for the mess. So those are the accumulated annual uh, CO2 uh, emissions. Yellow are European countries. Blue is uh, the US. And then you see, for example, because we focus on Africa today, uh, this is what African economies have um, contributed to CO2 to, uh, emissions globally. So hence the question of global justice and transformation cannot be answered without addressing uh, the climate crisis. And um, as we hinted before, the climate crisis is not only leading to like, a mass exodus and um, mass dying of people and uh, implies human hardship, but also, and this is what I'm working on, um, it implies huge macroeconomic uh, repercussions and problems. Because as Daniela pointed out before, every time there is a crisis, the global south is affected more uh, disproportionately, as Ndongo said, because um, a great exposure to international capital flows. And as the climate crisis is said to increase the likelihood of recessions and financial crisis, uh, those repercussions and problems associated with that will be additionally to the other problems be felt more in the global south than the global north. So as Matthias said, um, to think the two together, to think multiple crises together, is of utmost importance, including finance, even though most people might think this is a very unimportant and boring subject. Daniela. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, I, I want us to start from, again, thinking from the idea that there, is, there are these at least two twin crises that are going on at the same time, the COVID-19 crisis and the um, climate crisis and this diagnosis is not something that uh, has stayed within the world of, of uh, progressive economists uh, let's put it this way uh, we could have had the same conversation if this was a, a, a meeting organized by the world bank i think world bank and other international development institutions or international financial institutions governments in the uh, group g20 in the group of 20 countries recognize the, that uh, there is this uh, twin crisis going on uh, and the question that is being asked is how do we deal with this twin crisis and here it is important as progressive economists and as progressives in general that want to mobilize for for different alternatives to understand that what we what is happening now is a political struggle for a narrative of the response to the to this double crisis and in the driving seat of the of the forces that are shaping this political narrative is global finance uh, and and the the, the narrative uh, the, this mainstream narrative of how to address this crisis goes like this and i want uh, to take you through some of the arguments that are being made but the the logic is we need a some form of uh, building back better one way or another uh, we need recovery plans and these recovery plans should be uh, finance led that is uh, the global finance, uh, because there is so much money sloshing around and the, in this usual mainstream narrative, the, there is this image of trillions of dollars of money from institutional investors, from my pension fund or from my insurance company. They are moving around and because they can't find many good opportunities uh, and profitable opportunities in the global north, we should try to help them come to the global south in order to, to help us finance uh, uh, these uh, recovery plans. And particularly when they think about uh, the, the sort of main idea in these recovery plans is that we need more infrastructure investment. I uh, invite you to read any boring uh, announcement from the World Bank or from any government that is thinking through uh, what is the recovery plan now and you will see infrastructure is ubiquitous everywhere and when we they talk about infrastructure they don't just mean roads or um, airports uh, and we can think about the, the consequences for the climate crisis of this uh, airport discourse but they also think about social infrastructure that means uh, health that means education um, and the, the logic is 
we have to work together uh, in order to uh, escort this global finance towards the global south to make it more attractive for global investors uh, to make infrastructure projects financeable or bankable or investable. You will hear these words, they, they sound uh, very complicated, but they are not. Uh, and there are various places where one can look to, to sort of map out what does it mean to make the global south more attractive for global investors. And I, I mean, I, we're talking about the global south here because I think it's uh, more important because the, the double crisis will hit there much, much harder in some ways. But this is a, the, the same kind of narrative that you find in almost every country in the global north as well. It is infrastructure re recoveries and where countries are already faced by uh, Fridays for future protests, there is a, a recognition that, well, if we do infrastructure investment, it should be green infrastructure and we should have green recoveries one way or another. And uh, several examples of this, of what does it mean to a company or to escort global finance towards the global south? Uh, it is, you can find it in the G20 compact with Africa that was introduced under the, the German presidency of the, of the G20. And the idea is that, we, that governments and international uh, financial institutions or multilateral development banks like the World Bank or the African Development Bank or the um, Asian uh, Development Bank should uh, find ways in which to make uh, the Global South more attractive. And for that, they have to put some money into the risking investment projects in the Global South, right? Uh, very important. That comes with a free trade agreement. That is, we have to have more free trade, although the discourse from the Trump administration in the US is that the uh, international trade and free trade is not good for the US, but for the global south, the free trade agreements are being pushed further down. And this comes with a, a specific uh, mechanisms and strategies to open the, up the global south financial systems more to uh, investors from the global north. I call this the Americanization of local financial systems in the global south that says your old state-owned banks and bank-dominated financial systems are not good enough because they cannot attract, they cannot generate the kind of financial instruments, they cannot produce the kind of financial instruments that uh, global investors like. So why don't we help you make your local financial systems look like ours uh, in order to uh, facilitate these financial flows coming in, right? And what that, what that means in practice is liberalizing financial services, which is often a, a very important provision in free trade agreements, that is opening up to uh, the investors with uh, significantly much more resources and capital from the global north. And, and that's a form of, I'm, I'm going to let you let Ndongo talk about this at greater length, but that's a form of sort of financial colonialism one way or another, because it means more either more foreign ownership of the local financial system or more foreign ownership of local financial instruments or assets uh, that comes with specific forms of uh, vulnerability, right? Very important as well uh, in there is we have the same logic that we had since the 1970s of the Washington consensus that is in a sense very antithetic to the state. The state ownership in the financial system is very much rejected if for example, if you look at the World Bank, they have this, uh, car this uh, current discourse of pressuring um, countries in the global south to either privatize their state-owned banks or their development banks, which used to be uh, state-owned institutions that work together with um, uh, other in uh, institutions of the state in order to design and finance some industrial policy. The idea is you have to privatize those, or if you don't privatize them, then let's reorient their activities in order to de-risk these financial assets, to take some risks away from institutional investors. So uh, they find it more attractive to come to the global south. And very important, these in, uh, attempts to bring global finance into the global south come with a com commodification of public goods. That is a quasi privatization of health services, of education services, of infrastructure. Think, for example, uh, I think that one of the best examples, and I'm going to introduce very briefly an acronym and explain it. It's public-private partnerships, for example, for uh, building uh, highways. And that is, if you want, if uh, Ghana or Uganda wants a highway, or if it wants a very large uh, renewable energy plant, uh, the, local, uh, fi the local financial system cannot afford to finance it because it doesn't have the capacity. But why don't we get a German company to work together with some global institutional investors 
uh, and in the partnership with the Ghanaian state, they, they will build this uh, uh, renewable energy plant, they will issue bonds that will be sold to global investors, and the, the Ghanaian state will, uh, will promise to take some risks from in these public-private uh, public partnerships away from the private, system, uh, private sector. For example, uh, in the renewable energy sector, uh, the Ghanaian government, or there is an example with the Cameroonian government as well, it will uh, uh, promise to uh, to buy the, ener the renewable energy produced by the private sector, by this uh, private company that has built the, the, the plant. It will promise to buy it at a certain price in order to make sure that there is always a demand for this product, right? Which basically means then that the Ghanaian government has to sell uh, uh, the renewable energy to its citizens and to its companies at, at a price that is ultimately decided in a legal contract that very few of us know uh, how it was designed, and there is very little accountability for it. And I'm going to let Anne talk a bit more about the infrastructure investment uh, and uh, in, in green sector. Well, Daniela has already spoken quite, uh, said quite a lot of the things I was going to say. Um, Thank you for that. Uh, I'm gonna uh, make one thing more clear though. Uh, she's mentioned um, de-risking financial assets and de-risking is actually misleading as a term as it only outsources risks from private investors and puts them into public sector hands. So basically, assets financial assets become more risky for the public sector of the issuing country and less de-risked for private financial sectors so and this instrument is particularly popular um in the renewable energy infrastructure projects in the global south even though it's not new i think in argentina there were like de-risking means in the um uh 19th century and the building of infrastructure of railroads but the scope and concentration on renewable energy sector is quite new and very recent and yeah and daniela has um published extensively about it so actually she's the expert in this um so the idea is basically that the state guarantees some sort of profitability for the financial sector who's shipping in um, the money and uh, who buys up the um, the assets. Um, so for example, for when there is too little demand because electricity is too expensive for the local population, then the state steps in and guarantees a certain price um, for this electricity. And yeah, so other risks might in, uh, include uh, things like environmental uh, regulation, which the financial um, investor has then to get compensated for if the state decides to introduce them. Other things might be civil unrest, trade unionism, and so on and so on. So basically those de-risking um, measures in those contracts uh, contracts are basically ensuring profitability and very often in order to ensure that the state is um able to pay uh, for those de-risking measures funds are set aside uh and administered by other institutions like third party institutions uh making sure that the financial investors then get the money they were promised to get through de-risking measures. Uh, in other cases, there are ways how um, state income or revenues like taxation has been pledged um, for those payments. And Dongo, now I hand over to you, talking about the refusal of debt cancellation. Yeah, one, one aspect of the power of global finance uh, could be uh, observed currently with the <coughs> management of the pandemic. 
because what happened was that um, uh, when the pandemic started, many African countries uh, find themselves in a difficult economic and financial situation because their export incomes have been declining uh, due to low demand, due to declining commodity prices. And um, at the same time, they have to pay uh, their external debt. They have to, to service it. And this debt has been uh, growing, let's say, uh, for a decade. Why? Because after the, um, in the aftermath of the um, global financial crisis, there have been very, um, uh, let's say, um, lax uh, monetary policies in the global north, so-called uh, quantitative easing policies. And uh, most investor would, uh, most investor in sovereign bonds would find very, uh, let's say, uh, 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 small yields in the um, in developed countries in the global north. So some investors uh, went heavily in the global south to um, to buy bonds from sovereign government in the global south. And this was a period when people were speaking about Africa rising, etc. And most African countries uh, issued euro bonds often at very high uh, interest rate with very high yields. And um, when the pandemic uh, began, they were in a situation where they could no longer pay this debt uh, because paying this debt would mean uh, sacrificing the efforts to, to address the health and economic challenges uh, associated with, with the pandemic. But what has changed is that now we are more and more uh, uh, taking debt uh, towards private creditors. Before then, what uh, the type of uh, debt we have was debt de dominated in foreign currencies, but debt owed to the uh, multilateral partners like uh, the IMF, International Monetary Fund, or the World Bank, or the African Development Bank. We owe debt also to NVL countries like uh, Japan, the UK, or France. But now, uh, more and more, the debt we owe is to private creditors. That means uh, individual investors holding sovereign bonds. And those individual investors, they do not want, um, let's say, to give moratorium to African countries or even cancel the debt. They want to be paid. And uh, there has been a debate among some African countries. For example, the president of my country saying that uh, now we could not afford to pay debt, so we have to cancel it. The global north has to do to us that, that favor. But there are other countries, and most of them say, no, no, we have to pay the debt because we want to maintain access to global financial markets. Because it's only through having access to global financial markets that we will be able to um, to have this, this economic recovery. So this is a, a powerful uh, sign of the um, of the power of the power of, uh, of of global markets, and uh, in particular, the private creditors. After this disastrous diagnosis of all the things that are wrong, um, we now switch to a more positive outlook and um, present what we've come up with as possible uh, um, solutions to the current state. Uh, well, I mean, the thing is, for in order to install global justice, many things have to be done, such as, for example, acknowledging that climate vulnerability is a valid reason to seek asylum. We have to, um, you know, allow people seeking seeking security and seeking a livelihood here to. Uh, enter and live here and you know other things too um but as we are going only going to concentrate on um the financial side and yes yeah, so it has been one rather reformist um uh, proposal was to have recurrent reparation payments for the climate crisis and the uh, adverse ad effects of colonial legacy um so reparation payments are basically like compensation payments and they have been implemented in the past for example um in case of war when an aggressor state has lost the war such as such as germany for example um 
they were obliged to pay some of the losses and destructions they inflicted in other countries. So there has been presidency and um, basically given the severity of the climate crisis, it's uh, due that this logic of inflicting destruction uh, and suffering onto others uh, has become for um it's also time that is after the climate crisis so this has been suggested uh one example for reparation um was the payment of uh for the genocide of the herero and nama in namibia uh, by germany which took place at the beginning of the 20th century which cost hundreds of thousands of um people in namibia their life and so yeah germany offered this year offered 10 million euros um to the namibian government which is outrageously low given that for example germany in 2018 exported armament worth 770 billion which is milliarden um of euros so just to give you a scope and a comparison. Um, so uh, in, in the context of the climate crisis, um, reparation uh, payments have been promised in the Paris Agreement and a global environmental facility in green, and the Green Climate Fund has been set up. However, uh, the numbers um, are far too low in comparison to what is actually needed to have um, adoption and mitigation measures in those countries most affected. And even the, the small amounts that have been guaranteed or have been promised have not been paid out yet. So this has to change. Um, don't go. Yeah, and I, I would add before going to the next point that the point about reparation is also that uh, uh, contrary to uh, what most people think, uh, the Global South is uh, financing the Global North. When there is a measure we call uh, net resource transfers, that means the net amounts of financial resource that are transferred from the Global North to the Global South. We see that those resources are negative. That means that transfers are happening the other way that means that the global south is financing the global north when you take into account all kind of financial flows and we do not take into account in in those measures about the environmental damage being being done because sometimes when you exploit oil and yeah there are some kind of extractive in industries there are a lot of ecological damage and this is not taken into account in two financial measures so the point is also to say that if we want, we have just one planet and we have to make it sustainable for each of us. So the point is we have to stop this kind of negative transfers uh, from the global south to the global north and to be in a logic where uh, there could be a transfer of technologies which will help uh, green structural transformation. And uh, this is also linked to, to, to the next point, the decommodification of essentials. This is how a utopia in the sense that uh, we think uh, everybody, uh, everyone in this planet uh, should uh, have what is essential for, for dignified life because uh, we are committed to substantive equality. That means all human beings somehow are equal, are entitled to a number of uh, uh, goods and services that are essential for, 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 for dignified life. For example, everything uh, linked to healthcare, education, food, shelter, local transformation, local uh, transportation, and living in a peaceful and safe uh, <clears throat> environment. All those things are really uh, important for a decent, let's say, human civilization. And that means we have to go uh, against the agenda of uh, the likes of the IMF, uh, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the Global Finance, uh, which not only want to uh, commodify those public goods, but also more and more transform them 
as opportunities for financial speculation. And so if you want a, a better world for, for all of us, and if you want to tackle uh, climate change, we have to go that line, the line of uh, substantive equality, where everything that is needed for a uh, dignified life is affordable to every one of us, every one. Yes, and those this provision and our utopia with uh, food, energy, shelter, transportation, hence mobility, education, um, is at its best sourced from local resources. Um, and if this is impossible, then there should be like a regional coordination among administrative entities don't necessarily have to be nation states and um in order to coordinate that uh, we've been thinking of maybe having like something like regional clearing unions which is like a central bank overseeing the transactions between different regions so that um one can somewhat make sure that, um, you know, that there is not a net transfer from one region to the other, even though we still have to think of what role the price mechanism would play in this um, coordination, regional coordination. And, uh, but we think that, you know, even though, uh, it's important to, to have, like, uh, for example, local food chains, given that the climate crisis is so severe uh, and food sovereignty might not be ensured on a local level. Um, the Global North has some responsibility, a lot of responsibility in order to ensure that uh, food, sover food sovereignty can be guaranteed, hence the reparation payments which can be in kind or in money. Yes, and we've also been thinking of um, uh, re-regionalizing financial local institutions, which are less of a, um, you know, local banks, but more of uh, administrational unions, which um, coordinate like no local projects and no local coordination needs and hence um, coordinate more than finance, green public infrastructural programs or um, equitable um, social programs like schools, hospitals, and so on. But maybe the other two would like to add something to that. In this case, Ndongo. Maybe before Ndongo, um, I will just um, want to encourage everyone who's listening to put questions into the chat um, that we will then discuss collectively after you guys finish um, the spirit input. Thanks. Yeah. One, one, one aspect of this um, agenda for green transformation and uh, the commodification of uh, essentials is to create opportunities so that everybody could have access to a, to a decent job. And um, we think that um, the agenda of green transformation offers such kind of opportunities because there are many uh, kind of activities that are good, let's say, for, for the collectivities which are uh, which could be uh, let's say developed further and which could provide jobs and incomes to a uh, large um, segments of um, the, the the workers uh, in the, in the global south and also in the in the global north so the idea of um, uh, promoting decent jobs or job guarantee is to make sure that uh, uh, every time we find people who want to work but who doesn't uh, find work through the ordinary working of the labor market, the state steps in to provide that kind of uh, opportunity. 
And in the global south, in particular, we see that most of the labor force is in the agricultural sector. So uh, normally they have the, the lands, even if we know there are a lot of pressure through land grabbing, but they have the lands and they have the opportunity to work, but uh, they don't have adequate support in terms of access to credit or access to uh, good guaranteed prices. So one aspect of a job guarantee here would be rather to uh, to support them having good prices so that they could uh, uh, step out of uh, poverty and increase productivity and so on. In the urban uh, economies, generally it's different because we know there is a lot of informality and most people are involved in low productivity activities. But the state could um, try to um, give them employment on ecologically uh, related uh, issues. There are a certain number of uh, examples like uh, planting trees, like uh, uh, renewing the urban spaces. There are many things that, that, that could be done. Uh, it could be done in an experimental way uh, so that uh, there are possibilities to um, imply more and more people towards ach achieving, let's say, um, a, a socio-ecological transformation. And at, at the same time, uh, a job guarantee would boost aggregate demand because we know that most uh, uh, local enterprises uh, in the global south could not compete internationally. They could not expect a, a, a demand, let's say, from the world market. So at one point, if uh, people have uh, uh, um, higher, higher incomes, have access to, to good jobs, this could provide a, a local demand for, for the local um, enterprises and this could also help spur uh, domestic uh, development. So on a more optimistic note, there are already promising projects like Ndongo, you mentioned a massive um, tree planting programs in Bangladesh. I know this also took place in Ethiopia. Uh, and um, Daniela found an example of a recently opened um, electrified bus company where the buses are actually assembled in Uganda. Uh, yes, so things do improve to some extent. So, but by now we've already reached some so Ethiopian states uh, as three are already jobless, but this doesn't matter anymore because we got rid of global finance and um, uh, we find other things to do in the meantime. Uh, what else? So what we've been discussing too was uh, who are our potential allies? Um, there are some divergent um, stances <laughs> on this issue. <laughs> uh, yes, so some of us say that um, it would be good to have the elite on our side. Uh, so the white color BlackRock CEOs should also be um, convinced uh same as macro institutions and um state uh factionaries and others would say that the nation nation state won't do it because the nation state is acting in the interest of um big capital and uh, international corporations and that the only hope lies in social movements and international solidarity so I guess the truth lies somewhere in between those two. How about targeting both? And can I can I just add that uh, now that we've imagined the utopia, the left is disintegrating into separate uh, churches. Uh, I I I'm I'm not I wasn't going to suggest. So my utopia is a world where we have uh, state bureaucrats uh, in in suits, not black rocks, but state bureaucrats in suits that are able to design, organize, uh, and administer the kind of utopias that we want to imagine. And I'm saying this not only because I'm a, I'm a macroeconomist and I believe that the macroeconomic institutions of the state are fundamental 
to any kind of utopia that we want to imagine. I, maybe it's a, a, a sort of failure of my imagination uh, and I grew up in communism, so that maybe it, it's eaten away at my imagination. Uh, but I, it, it, it is a failure of my imagination to think that we can live utopias without a, a state. And this is something that we can discuss. I think to me it is important to, in the, in the kind of narratives that we are proposing that are saying, uh, what, what we have now in, in the international policy discourse, in the hegemonic discourses that have global finance behind them, what we have is a fundamental reorienting of the social safety nets that the state has created for us and we pay for it. The social safety nets for the citizens are getting moved towards creating social safety nets for global finance. This is what the de-risking project is doing, the de-risking project that I explained very well. And, and to my mind, to, to come back to a, a, a sort of political economy where you, the social safety net uh, that the state is creating functions for its citizens means that you also need to have the macroeconomic institutions of the state functioning in a way that serves public interest. I, I, this is what interests me. How do we think about uh, boring people in suits? And I am probably one of these boring people in suits, although I don't wear one today, I should have. Uh, but uh, just just to defend my position, but I think it, it's important not to leave aside the questions of uh, what is happening to the ministries of finance and to the central banks in the utopias that we want to create. Unless we think that these utopias will not involve any institutions whatsoever that resemble the old institutions, and I'm very curious to hear what kind, what what you talk, what institutions are in the utopias without central banks. Uh, but if we have these uh, my my limited utopias. Uh, I think it's very important that to carve domestic policy autonomy, to think about green structural transformations, you need to have capable bureaucrats, you need to have institutional capacity for uh, organizing utopias in a way that doesn't just keep it, you know, at the level of having a nice conversation by the lake uh, and fantasizing about uh, a world where we're all equal. Uh, but uh, I don't know, I'll let him don't go and then uh, uh, provide you with a more, uh, with with a less grey suited utopia, and maybe, maybe we can continue from there. Well, I I do agree with uh, what Daniela just said. We need um, state with um, some capacities, uh, developed capacities to um, transform the economy to uh, make our utopias happen. Uh, but um, let's say more pessimistic than her in the ability of uh, our states, even with the right capacities, to go towards the type of utopias we might imagine have for ourselves, because we know there are those kind of political interests and, and so on. Uh, I would just say that um, uh, even if they have the capacities, uh, the states, as they are, will not go to the direction of change we want. There has to be some kind of a pressure democratic pressure. So that means that uh, um, social movements, uh, ordinary citizens, all pressure groups uh, should mobilize to try to show them the direction, to, to leave them no option. Because that's what global finance is, is doing with our states, remodeling, uh, reshaping our states. So we have to have a counter power from below so that, yeah, they are focused on, on the type of change. We want. Sometimes there are many people who are nostalgic of the development state. I am not nostalgic of the development state because it happened in a particular era during the Cold War, and there was so much tolerance for so-called authoritarian governments. And so we are no longer in this type of historical context. We need a new development state that is democratic and that is, let's say, really responsive to um, citizen pressure and which is associating also other citizen. So for me, uh, uh, economic progress goes hand in hand with democratic pro progress. And in the context of what Ndongo just said about the de development of the state, um, one should not forget that the Asian, South Asian tigers um, which are taken as like the ultimate a good example of uh, what a developmental state is capable of doing, uh, basically have to uh, 
have their success based on the back of indigenous people and on the back of women on the back of the marginalized people because this is because the exploitation of those groups allowed those states to then industrialize and in themselves contribute to the climate crisis so those things also have to bear in mind uh, have to be borne in mind but uh, Matthias, are there interesting questions? So maybe we move on to yes. that. Thank you very, very much for this uh, very broad input you three put together, laying out um, how much finance has us all in its grip and how difficult it is to, to escape. Um, there are a lot of questions. Um, I will just highlight a couple of them. Um, maybe I will read out three or four um, and then you can see who wants to answer to which questions we currently we have five questions just as an overview so one question is very simply um, how will we be able to move away from the free trade towards fair trade a second question is how can power be taken away taken away from huge financial actors such as blackrock um, assuming they don't agree to hand it over voluntarily, which they will not. Um, another question, very much more particular, is how do you panelists rate the British government's scrapping overseas aid department and Johnson saying it's a giant cash point in the sky? Um, and then there are more questions, but I think we will leave it with these three. Um, on the question of free trade and fair trade, the question of taking away the power from financial institutions and British aid institutions. Who wants to go first? And you don't, you don't all need to answer to each question, but um, I think you can collectively develop a good answer. I think no, Dongo should take the fair trade question. Okay. And I can do BlackRock and me and Anna can do BlackRock and the, the uh, British aid. I'm happy to talk about British aid. Okay, don't go. Go. Yeah. Uh, th thanks for this question. Uh, I, in, in the German Marshall Plan, there is this idea of moving from free trade to fair trade. And what is imp interesting is that this logic is not the logic of the compact with Africa, which is the logic of let's say, um, um, extending the power of finance in Africa and other people, uh, regions. But I think if you want to move from free, free trade to fair trade, we have first to document, uh, let's say, the, the balance sheet of free trade agreements, what they have done to people, what they have done to the environment. Uh, because generally people think that, yeah, uh, most countries develop through free trade. No, no country develops through free trade. Because if you want to develop your economy, you have to specialize on uh, activities which could bring, let's say, economic growth, productivity on the long term. But when you are on the logic of free trade, you mean that you are specializing on what you could do. And de developing countries could do only, let's say, um, low productivity activities so that means activities that will make them poor and that will uh, destroy the environment so we have to go against free trade by uh, uh, uh by uh, showing the real nature of free trade and being against free trade does not mean that uh, we are <clears throat> committed to autarky that means we have to have other principles meaning for example uh, we have to cooperate to address common challenges for example how we could make sure that everybody could uh, every uh, could have a uh, self-sufficiency in terms of uh, food in terms of energy etc we could have global uh, cooperation agreement going against logic of free trade and that means also going against logic of institutions such as the wto the world trade organization because the mandate of the world trade organization is free, free trade worldwide and to the benefit of let's say global global companies not not the global north only but global companies. So we have to change those institutions and also see the, document the reality of uh, free trade. Okay, thanks so much. Daniela and Anna, how about taking away the power from the big institutions? I got no idea how to do that. I leave that to Daniela. She's more... 
<laughs> an expert on that. But I wanted to add something to what um, Dongo just said. Basically, that there is a strong hypocrisy currently because obviously we've got proponents of free trade, but on the other side, we've got a strong uh, protection of intellectual property rights and a strong um uh well basically i mean as longo said um uh, development are like the early developers such as germany for example they never developed through a uh, free trade and they developed through a very strong industrial um espionage for example so for example in the german case there was um there were German spies going to the UK and spying on their blast furnaces and copied them. So, you know, are those conditions which allowed early developers to become the powerful industrialized countries they are now in are not allowed for the late developers right now? So, yeah. Daniela, how to get rid of black rock. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so I'm, I keep mentioning black rock and uh, there is a stream on my Twitter feed where I spend a lot of my professional life on Twitter. There is a stream that is dedicated to documenting what black rock is doing, which I guess will be useful for posterity, even if not for uh, uh, bringing them down. Uh, and I think that this is a very legitimate question in the sense that in, in the 2008 global financial crisis, there was a, a, a political strategic moment when uh, the, the power of global finance came under questioning precisely because we saw how damaging the, the economic and social effects of um, um, global financial practices can be, and when I say global finance, I mean mostly global north. I mean, there is not very much finance with political power in the global south that makes a difference, although we can talk about um, uh, illegal sort of financial flows that are being uh, redirected from um, the global south into the global north through tax havens, and, and that's a really interesting conversation to be had. So that, that was a strategic moment and we lost it in a, in a way, uh, the progressives lost the opportunity to do, to do that. I, and I think in part because uh, we didn't, we weren't very well for the moment, uh, the problem we didn't solve finance. Uh, now uh, with a global, uh, with a COVID-19 pandemic, um, there has been very little uh, conversation around uh, why, uh, how is the uh, political power being distributed and why this matters in terms of shaping the narratives of responses to the crisis. And, and that was very important even before the COVID-19 pandemic. For example, you can see in the European Union, the entire Green Deal discussions uh, that were applauded outside the European Union because they, of the logic of we have to do something about the climate crisis and we will do it as a, as a European Union, we will put the, the public institutions in the service of, of dealing with the climate crisis. That's a very powerful discourse to come out of Brussels for, for climate movements. But when you start to look into what do they actually mean, then you will see that uh, that partnership with private finance is very important in that story. So how do we move away from this partnership between uh, the, the sort of political elite that we have at the moment and the, the financial elite that has a lot of political power behind the scenes? Uh, that's that's a difficult question. I have a book since I'm in my office uh, at home. I have, I have a book now. Let's see if I can show it to you. It's called The Hellhound of Wall Street by Michael Perino. And this is a book. It's easier to read than my research. Uh, in a sense, it's, it's written like a novel. And it documents the, the way in which uh, the uh, political power of uh, finance in the US, and that, this is something very important to bear in mind. When we think about the last 30 years as macroeconomists, we think about a, a, a financial globalization story. That is a story where finance becomes more and more important globally, where barriers of movement between countries, between currencies, between different types of financial instruments are being gradually removed, pre precisely because of the political power that global finance has. Uh, and um, 
the, the, this story of financial globalization is not unique to the uh, to the last 30 years. We had the same sort of uh, freely f flowing uh, finance and very politically powerful finance in the U.S. from the late 19th century until nine, uh, until the Second World War. And it was with the same sort of uh, organization of the financial system where you had these institutional investors and asset managers. They looked a bit different or they were called different in, in, the, in those times. But we had the same uh, sort of distribution of political power then. And the 1929 crisis is a crisis of this type of finance that we have now. It was a, a, a crisis uh, very similar to uh, what we had in 2008. And what we learned from that moment is that uh, there has to be political willingness for a black rock to, to, to lose its uh, important uh, political power or for global finance to use uh, to lose its political power they will not give it away we know this as a as a feminist I, I know this that it's very difficult to uh, for for people in privileged positions to give away their privilege it has to be taken away to, to take that away you we need to do what uh, Michael Pecora did in, in 1933 when he did it, and this book documents it very well where he systematically showed shown in a, a public trial how uh, uh, a bank was then called the uh, wait I'll, I'll, I'll Sorry, the, the name the of the bank was, uh, it was called national city bank and uh, the city Say again the connection again? was un the connection was not good could you repeat the last sentence please Okay, so so what I'm saying is that the the experience of the 1930s shows that uh, that you can go after powerful uh, financial interests like Black Now. Then it was uh, the old version of City uh, Bank Group. It requires a, a political willingness to reform, and it requires citizens to be interested in in pushing for global finance. And what this book does, it documents very well the outrage that people in the US felt with the way in which the financial system had speculated and made profits up to the 1929 financial crisis. And that's very important because uh, public mobilization and when, when we put on, those, and on that last slide the difference between having uh, enlightened bureaucrats and having social movements, to me these two have to go hand in hand together uh, because political accountability and the need for reform has to uh, has to come from uh, citizens all over the world and that's why we are doing this uh, and that's why to me it's important to see and to think about global finance because mm -hmm. you have to understand who is driving the political processes in order to to try to change them and as long as we are not at the table with them and we're not pressuring them then uh, we might be doomed to have nice uh, conferences uh, online or offline uh, mm -hmm. but not really participate where it matters and i think th this to me is this what is at stake here understanding global finance and how it operates politically is fundamental to reforming it so for for me this is the the first step to changing the political power of blackrock is sitting with them and 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 speaking their language and and saying that we understand what what is happening we understand your political power and we want it to, we want it to be reduced on i will say very so, something very quickly on the uk aid budget uh i and i want to make i mean uh, i think Overall, the idea that there is uh, foreign aid, um, and I think people <coughs> sort of, uh, around that defend that as a form of some reparation, right? In the sense that we're going to spend some money in order to push certain projects in sorry, the global sorry, south. Sorry, sorry. Yes. You've again, again, the connection again. was, um, was um, interrupted. Okay, I'm going to switch my camera off. Um, please, maybe we can try it. Yeah. So I, I was going to say that although I understand uh, the political symbolism of foreign aid, I wouldn't walk in, I wouldn't go in the street to protest protest against it, or protest against the the, the re, uh, reducing uh, the budget for foreign aid simply because if we look at how foreign aid actually operates, and I advise you to look at that not only for the UK but also for Germany. Germany is a very good example of the KFW, the National Development Bank, and other. Uh, uh, foreign aid institutions who are pushing this de-risking project that we talked about, the social safety net for global finance, as a, a development paradigm, they are pushing it in, in the global south. So to my mind, uh, there is a Trojan horse there, and this Trojan horse, we have to think very carefully, do we want to defend it? Is foreign aid doing the things that we really wanted to do in the, in the global south, or is it pushing the same sort of 
global finance partnership discourses that we should be resisting because what they do is they, they redirect the resources from regular citizens towards global finance. This is my worry. So I personally think, uh, okay, then let's talk about reforming foreign aid so, so that it, it works for a green structural transformation. This doesn't happen at the moment. Or if it, if it does, it, there are very small uh, uh, exceptions. The story that Anna mentioned about this Ugandan electrical company, state-owned company, uh, that, be, that is built on a technological capacity in partnership with, with China. Uh, to, I don't see any of the standard uh, international development actors, no foreign, uh, neither the German or the UK uh, development aid institutions involved there. But if I look at the, I can, I can name several uh, projects of uh, local currency bond markets or securitization in, in uh, uh, African countries where there is German official money. Why is German official money going there? I don't know, there are many German I would like to add something on the question of how to um, get rid of a powerful black rock. And of course, it's no surprise. Anna, before you go too long, there's uh, more questions coming in. Okay. So then we can also move on to the other questions. Thanks. Okay. Um, so just very briefly, I think one way to look at it would be to see where the profits come from and where they're being made. So in the case of BlackRock, a lot of it comes from real estate. So to support struggles and actually get involved uh, in struggles like rent strikes and social housing for all, I think is ultimately also taking away the power of um, speculators with housing and real estate. Same applies for food speculation and basically as Dongo pointed out, um, like local struggles working on or um, fighting for food sovereignty, for decommodified housing, uh, uh, free education and so on and so on are ultimately as a side effect also um, taking away power from big financial corporations. Full stop. Okay, I, I do have uh, three more questions and one is also related to the question of way of aid. So maybe Ndongo, if you want to also add something on that. Um, so it's a question basically building on what we discussed now, um, coming from the different direction. It's asking, since countries in the global south lack fiscal space, how could a green structural transformation be initially financed in the global south? Um, so if it's not aid, what is it then? Reparations or, or which other kind of like means could we use for this? Then there's um, a second question. How do we achieve utopia under global financing when we do not, do not address fundamental issues of neocolonialism in Africa? What is your take on that? And finally, a question uh, that was put on Twitter um, asks, um, this probably also goes to Ndongo, could the already existing financial infrastructure of the CFR France be transformed into one of the proposed clearing unions with the moving of authority from Paris to the countries themselves? Or is this wish, wishful thinking? Nongo, do you want to go first? Yeah, yeah, I could. Um, regarding the first uh, question about aid, I agree with that what Daniela said and also what uh, what Anne said. Uh, yeah, uh, what is important is the logic of aid. We know that uh, aid generally in the global south has been an um, an instrument to control, let's say, uh, global south countries and also uh, uh, contribute to the um, interests of the private sector of each donor country. That has been the logic of aid. That's why often aid has not been uh, received uh, for structural transformation. You would see that uh, those countries that has been helped, those countries which had seen debt cancellation in the 1980s are the same countries which are still asking for, for, for debt cancellation because this is a structural logic uh, 
of aid, enhancing the interests of, of, of the donor countries, provided that there is this change of direction towards, let's say, structural transformation of countries with global south. Maybe um, aid will be, uh, uh, let's say, uh, may have a greater development impact. Uh, saying that countries in the global south lack fiscal space is something we could debate. Because what is important is not the, um, the financial resources, but the real resources. Do you have land? Do you have the workers? Do you have the technical know-how, etc.? If you do not have that, yeah, you have a constraint. You have technical constraint. You have maybe labor constraint, etc. And so, before talking about fiscal space, what is important is to say these are the kind of real resources I have, and you could also design good banking and financial systems which could help finance local project so before asking help from foreign finance we, we have first to say what kind of resources do we have what kind of long-term developmental project do we want to have and which resource could we rely on and from there we could say yeah we need something from germany we need something from france etc you take the countries for example in, in west africa they say you do not need to have uh, public banks uh, you do not need to uh, subsidize your agriculture. Private investor will, will do that for you, will create development, and we know that will, that will never be the case. So if we uh, give our countries, our government, more domestic uh, 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 space for their development policies, I think many things could be done without having resources to aid or foreign, foreign finance. We don't need, for example, foreign debt investment to develop African agriculture because you, we have land, we have the workers. We just need banks, good banks, and also good uh, appropriate economic uh, incentives. In Senegal, for example, it's just uh, the, the agricultural sector uh, receives only 2% of total banking loans. And the agricultural sector is at least one half of the labor force. So you see this kind of disarticulation could not be served by, by foreign finance or by 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 eight regarding the the, um, the the cfa frank which is also linked to the second question about neocolonialism i i tend to make a difference between colonialism neocolonialism and maybe globalism or globalization because neocolonialism supposes let's say um uh close links between the former metropolises and its former colonies and you see for me we have a uh, uh uh, go beyond that stage. Uh, Daniela and Anne were talking about global finance, and global finance is really global. You take uh, banks in Senegal, for example, they used to be dominated by French banks, but this is no longer the case. You have foreign capitals coming from Qatar, coming from uh, many other countries, and those uh, forms of capitals uh, mixing together are shaping the, the Senegalese economy. So for me, neocolonialism is a uh, yeah, it's no longer a stage we are currently in. We are in a stage of neoliberal globalization, and there is not so that the kind of direct links between former colonies and um, and uh, and former uh, former metropolis. And the uh, uh, influence of China in Africa uh, is is a sign of that because China is now competing on uh, let's say France by, uh, uh, private uh, backyards of the UK, etc. So we are in age of globalization. As for the um, possibility of transforming the CFA Frank, I think this is not a, a technical issue. I think uh, the debate is rather clear regarding the um, shortcomings of, of the CFA Frank. Everybody knows it's a colonial currency. It's an anachronism. It is not helpful for any uh, economic development or social transformation. But we know it's political. It's political because uh, they are head of states which are loyal to France. And those head of states, even if they have been elected democratically, they know that they will be able to rule peacefully if they are in good terms with France. So those head of states on their own will never say to France, we want to break up the relationship, monetary relationship with you, to have a kind of monetary integration within uh, Western Africa or, or beyond. So this is, a, this is the issue. That's why uh, I was uh, um, saying earlier, even if we have the good bureaucrats and also the right capacities, if there is no democratic push, uh, something, yeah, there is this uh, inertia. But 
we could be hopeful that more and more young people in Africa are aware of the anomaly uh, named CFA Frank, and maybe this could change. Okay, maybe. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Daniela. Can I just add something to what Dongo said about fiscal space? Because this is a, a, a sort of phrase that bothers me a little bit because Sorry, we don't discuss Daniela. the politics of fiscal space, right? And Daniela, the connection is not good enough um, with video. So if you speak, you need to turn it off. Thank you. Yes. Sorry. Uh, okay, so I was talking. Just wanted to make a joke of the UK being a developing country when it comes down to broadband. Yes, I, I make this joke regularly when I, I remember uh, that uh, Jeremy Corbyn in a past life uh, promised to give us 5G and uh, here I am with uh, Virgin Media and Richard Branson trying to talk to you, uh, which is again a good example of decommodifying a public uh, good that should be proper broadband. Uh, but anyways, going back to the politics of fiscal space, I think uh, it's important to remember that uh, fiscal space is a narrative that comes from a, a very conservative macroeconomics, macroeconomic, macroeconomics that doesn't discuss enough uh, the kind of resources that are being uh, lost uh, to governments through a variety of political processes. And I want to mention here my friends from the Tax Justice Network in, in Africa that are doing tremendous work showing the 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 crazy amounts of illicit financial flows that are being redirected uh, from Africa into tax havens. Uh, and that's a very important thing to bear in mind that if there was enough global coordination to make sure that the multinational corporations pay their tax where they should be paying them, uh, that the domestic political elites uh, uh, pay their taxes or, or do not siphon uh, resources outside uh, countries, that, that would be an important first step into rethinking the notion of fiscal space. And what we're proposing here is, and, and maybe this is linked to the conversations about neocolonialism, uh, what we are suggesting is, is, is uh, reclaiming domestic policy autonomy uh, in a way that allows for the kind of structural transformations that are a, will make countries in the global south better prepared to deal with the climate crisis, right? So that to me is restoring policy autonomy. And if there is any kind of financial flows from the global north going through the global south, they can go through traditional, very simple financial instruments like government bonds that are being held for a long period of time. And the, and the interest that uh, governments in the global south pay on them are commensurate with uh, the developmental needs of the country. I'm, I'm not against that of, of any form. I just think that in the, the current system that we have is just creating a, a, an unacceptable safety net for global finance, where you uh, guarantee profits uh, and take away risks. This is unfair. If we have to de-risk for somebody, we should de-risk for uh, the farmers in Senegal, as Ndongo says, through a public development banks. This is what the kind of de-risking that we, we need the, the local financial system to do. Thank you very much. Anna, do you want to also add on these questions? Well, I mean, what came to mind was basically in, in the context of illicit capital flows and tax evasion is basically that one should bear in mind that there's not only a divide between investors and the ordinary people in the global south and the global north, but also among class, because obviously some people also in the global south profit more um from the current system than ordinary people as you can for example which are uh, what became visible in the Lu luanda leaks in angola for example or other cases so this must not be forgotten too so thank you very much um I think there is um, one last question and then I would put maybe also a final question uh, for a final round because we are already over the official time. We can t take a little bit longer, um, but um, at uh, quarter to five, we should definitely finish. 
Um, so the question that was put to the panel is, how would one think about it if the internet or World Wide Web is set up and prepared at the top speed in such a way that the world would be continued at a specific date, time from then on without any monetary means, without the constraints, the framework, the setting of money, finance, balance sheets, sales figures and trade, thus facing the catastrophe of unavoidable self-annihilation appropriately set up and prepared in order to possibly avert such a catastrophe, catastrophe at the historically very last second. So it's a very long question, but I think it's basically boils down to the question, just let us imagine that at, for example, um, the 1st January of 2030, um, we switch off everything that has to do with money and finance. Is this possible to imagine? Um, I just saw that another question has also come up that might be easier than this one. Can we move away from regarding banks as honorable and making them all ethically responsible? For example, by outlawing speculation. Um, and then my question um, that I want to put um, into the final round is basically um, during your input, there was a lot of um, talk about kind of like transforming finance and using finance for the transformation. But now later in the discussion, we also heard a lot about how in for many uh, parts of the transformation, we actually do not need finance. Finance is not the answer. Um, so I basically want to ask um, if you think about the like a really utopian future, how big is the role of finance in the end? Will, will, will the importance of finance decrease radically or will it just be transformed? Um, just to give us kind of like a glimpse into the magnitude, magnitude of um, how much our lives in such a utopian future will be shaped by money, money and finance. Um, and this might also be related somehow to this more radically put question of the, there being this one date after which money, finance, monetary means, constraints, frameworks, etc. the whole setting of money is abandoned. Who would like to go first on these rather challenging um, utopian questions? No one? Anna. Okay. I go first. Um, well, I think for the first question, I don't, I'm not quite sure whether I correctly understood it, but I guess it's got some it's hinting at how about having like a cut in the internet and like deleting all debtor, debtor and creditor relationships and get rid of things like, yeah, prices and finance. I mean, interesting idea, but if we haven't got written uh, of the capitalist system to then, then I think it's just going to be mayhem and so then I think we better have found another way of uh, coordination and, you know, have a better substitute how to uh, co coordinate economic activity without prices and without debt relations. Because if we haven't found a coordinating mechanism for human human needs, then, and how to go about them in the economic system, then I think uh, not much is won by just, you know, cancelling our relations. But I mean, maybe this is like the ultimate chaos out of which the new thing can emerge. I don't know. Um, as for the question on banks, I think, um, I mean, this is maybe for those who are not too familiar with uh, money creation. But um, in the current system, money can be created by by a stroke out of uh, nothing, which is called indigenous endogenous money creation, which does come with risks for banks, though. So, um, but what I would like to highlight, despite their very bad reputation, is that banks are actually pretty interesting and cool innovation i'd say because you know the current system allows to create um 
value and good things potentially out of nothing, which I think is absolutely key when it comes down to social uh, and ecological transformation. So I think the question is, yeah, how to make sure that they do um, instead of, you know, financing food speculation, or real estate bubbles and so on and so on. And yes, Matthias, uh, as for the last question, um, I think you absolutely uh, correctly understood us. I think, um, yeah, and the Utopia International Finance will just be diminished. And as said, yeah, this the free us from employment, as there's nothing to write futile things about anymore. Yeah, full stop. Thank you very much, um, Daniela or Ndongo, who wants to go? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would go in the, in, in the same way. Uh, for, for me, we could not abolish money, we could not abolish credit, but we might, um, uh, let's say, constrain the power of global finance. Why we could not abolish money and credit? Because money and credit are things are institutions that are common to, to, to human beings, that is an, um, an institution organizing social relationships. So every time we need the relationship of uh, debt and, and credit, so we could not abolish that. But we could design it in a way that is beneficial for the, for the majority. There is this uh, anthropologist, uh, Pierre Clastre, uh, who wrote this book, um, um, Society Against the State, uh, he was saying in another book that uh, <clears throat> in a democratic societies, those who rule are um, infinitely indebted uh, towards those who are ruled. That is a sign of democratic society. And this uh, uh, allowed us to see that we are no longer living in de democratic societies because uh, in oligarchic societies, those who are ruled are indefinitely uh, uh, in the credit and in debit relationships with those those who are ruling, so we have to change the the, the direction. But we could not abolish the relationship, and to change this um, direction, we have to uh, let's say put constraints on global finance. For me, we, we, uh, it's not desirable to abolish finance. We have to uh, specify what we mean by finance. We are talking about uh, a specific form of finance, which is capitalist finance at the age of neoliberal globalization. This kind of global finance is not desirable vis-a-vis uh, -vis the kind of objectives we may have. And also we have to specify that this kind of uh, global finance is also um, uh, inscribed in an irrational logic. The irrational logic is a logic of uh, endless economic growth, uh, compound interest rates. That means uh, society created create its output, and finance has always to um, to squeeze uh, this this output, uh, taking uh, every year a higher share of, of this output. This cannot um, this cannot uh, last long because uh, this would inevitably uh, generate a crisis. Uh, economic crisis, uh, ecological crisis, uh, etc. So we have to qualify the, the type of finance because finance is something desirable. We need finance to fund a project which are good for, for society. So we, what we could say that for me there's a tension because at the same time we need centralized forms of finance. Like Daniela said, we need centralized states, bureaucratic states. But at the same time, for the autonomy of local communities, we also need some kind of localized finance. I think we have to try a way to solve this, this tension. But this tension is inherent, and we could not solve it, uh, to, my, to my opinion. OK, I will try again with, with camera, and Matthias will tell me to switch it off quickly. I yeah, just put your hand up. And then I will switch it off, Matthias, if you can't hear me. Yeah? Okay, I'm assuming I... this is working. Okay. Uh, so just to um, sort of to continue, uh, first to say something about uh, making banks uh, and, and uh, financial institutions more broadly, because now it's not only banks that matter, but institutional investors. 
and I invite you, if you don't know a lot about them, to read it. They are very important uh, financial players, uh, very important uh, uh, sort of holders of political power, and we have to get to grips with, with that. But they, they are also uh, very clever people who are moving with the times, and now the, the talk about uh, ethical banking and ethical investment is probably the, the most important thing that is happening in the world of global finance. And there are new ways, new ratings, like you have a, a credit rating for a, a country uh, who, that captures how well, how, how likely it is that that country will be able to, to repay its debt. Now we have ethical ratings for uh, financial institutions and for the instruments that they issue. Uh, they, they come under the umbrella of ESG, environmental, social, and uh, governance ratings. So this is happening already, okay? Uh, so this is happening already. Uh, the bankers are trying to become ethical. Just we have to understand that their way of becoming ethical is to do a lot of greenwashing and a lot of social washing and, and governance washing in order to be able to claim the, this legitimacy of, of being ethical. So we, that is already happening. I, I'm, I'm concerned about the direction in, in which this is going, and, and we have to bear that in mind. On the question of uh, switching off. Uh, uh, the the internet and, and and balance sheet relationships that are denominated in in monetary terms uh this reminded me i mean i would i first i would agree with anna that there has to be some other way of uh, some other mechanism for organizing uh, our economic life one way or another before we do that and it reminded me of the socialist calculation debates in the 1920s and 1930s when, uh, when uh, the economists were thinking of how to organize life under socialism, where you don't have private property, you don't have money, you don't have banks that are creating credit, they were asking themselves, okay, so how do we do it, right? These are not new questions. These are all questions. And at the time, and this is not going to be consistent with many of the utopian ideas uh, that people who are uh, listening to us might have, at the time the idea was, well, if you don't have uh, money as an organizing principle uh, for these balance sheet relationships, then you'll have the state. And you'll have the state that is allocating economic activity. And at the time they didn't have a computer, so that was very difficult to do. But now we have computers, it could be done easier, I guess. The question is, do we want that kind of state uh, to replace uh, money-based relationships? They also talked about, uh, instead of using money as a unit of account, you could use labor as a unit of account. These are, these are very complex uh, debates. Uh, to my mind, uh, they, we, we'd have to settle first the question of, do we want to live in capitalism or not? Uh, I am not very clear. I have a, a, a straightforward answer to that, but this is... Uh, probably due to the fact that I come from a, a, a very failed attempt to organize life under socialism, uh, and I, I cannot imagine a, a more successful one for the moment. So I would rather we reform capitalism so it works for, for most of us rather than for the few. Okay, thank you very much. I think um, now in the end we dug really deep into the question of utopia um, and I hope this panel made clear, firstly, that finance is important if you want to discuss about uh, changing society, in particular about the, in the process of transformation. But it also showed that um, discussing financial reforms can also lead to a broader questioning of questions of employment, um, wage labor, economic growth, um, and possibly even money. Um, some of these questions are obviously also discussed in the rest of, um, of this conference, Future for All. Um, many of the panels uh, will be put online, so those who have missed them can watch them afterwards um, at the YouTube channel. Um, and yeah, I want to thank you very much for being here. Thanks for all the listeners and the questions you put to us. Um, thanks for the technical support in the background. And I wish you all a great day and thank you good. matthias for moderating very good moderation also pleasure thank you matthias thank you my Thanks. co finalist <laughs> yeah thank you have a lovely day yeah, thank bye you. bye, bye. Ciao. Ciao.